from a, a hand-to-hand, you know, a weaponless uh, altercation point of view is that there's now, there's so much video evidence of cops not being trained in just how to physically restrain people. So there's just some amazing videos I could show you, and I'll, I think I'll put uh, one or two online when we post this podcast. I'll put them on my blog. There's some amazing video of cops uh, wrestling with suspects. Uh, you know, three cops trying to figure out how to subdue one clearly unarmed, small, I mean, literally, so one video I'll show you, this gets, these videos get circulated in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community because people are just aghast that, you know, no one really knows at this point, you know, 20 years after the ultimate fighting championship, there are still cops who don't have sort of basic hand-to-hand skills in, 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 you know, in grappling in particular. So there was there's this one video that that has made the rounds and has um, commentary from Henner and Heron Gracie who who are great jujitsu teachers and it's I believe three cops all of whom look like they're 220 pounds trying to control an obviously drunk much smaller shirtless unarmed man shoeless man he's in stocking feet in a McDonald's on a on a slick floor he's got he's got literally no shoes three of them are trying to figure out how to bring him down. And they they can't solve the problem, and they go to a taser. Ultimately, they go to a taser. One tries to throw a front kick at him and can't do that. They, they ultimately tase this guy repeatedly, right? And it's just the most just ghastly incompetence from a martial arts point of view. And, I, and I'm not I'm not actually judging the cops here. I mean, the, the problem is they haven't been trained in in they don't mm-hmm. haven't been given the tools they need to solve this problem. And there's another video which perhaps you've seen of a what becomes a wrestling match that then winds up in a, in a lethal force or at least in a shooting in a Walmart parking lot with a kind of deranged family that just attacks the cops. I think this family had been harassing employees at this Walmart and the cops come on scene and you see this all from dash cam video. And there's, you know, it's a family of like eight people, men and women. And one cop says, okay, we need to separate the, the, this group here. And they wanted to, he wanted to control them by at first separating them. But the family refused to be separated, and they just, like on cue, became like the zombie family that was going to attack the cops. And it becomes this insane, protracted, 10-minute wrestling match with it, that, where the cops use every tool on their belts, from pepper spray to batons to tasers, totally ineffectually. One has his gun wrestled away from him, and it's all on camera. And it's, you know, it looks like, honestly, from the point of view of, of a trained martial artist, and again, this is not, not to judge these specific cops, but it looked like, you know, everyone had been dosed with some sort of neurotoxic agent where they just couldn't function properly. I'll show you these videos later, but it, it, in any case, so there's a, I think, a, a reasonable understanding of what you can't do in a situation to control a, an agitated, strong, athletic person non-lethally uh, would, in many cases, dictate an escalation of force on the, mm-hmm. on the part of a cop. Well, you know, your, your wonderful points again, and this is, you know, when I worked on the streets and still now, I work out all the time. Uh, I see some policemen that I think may need to work out a little bit more, let's put it that way nicely. The first incident you alluded to, had that occurred in a Krispy Kreme, the outcome might have been a lot different. Um, the bottom line is, look, I was involved in a ton of altercations as a policeman, and we did have a great tool back then, which is the bar arm, and then you could go straight into the carotid. Mm. Well, by which you mean a, a choke, like a, it's, a, it's a, a rear naked choke. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, rear naked choke, if you want to call it. We used to call them bar arm and then went into the carotid and put a lot of suspects out that way. I was choked out in the academy a number of times. Mm. You do combat wrestling back then, and guys, you know, one guy would hold you, they got your partner to choke you out, especially if you, to get your mind right, especially if you screwed up something. So it wasn't a big thing. You'd wake up, and next thing you know, you're in handcuffs, and this is what happened to suspects. But be, as a result of a few suspects dying, I don't know how many there were, but almost all of them, if I'm not mistaken, I may be speaking out of turn here, but had intoxication, like acute, uh, acute cocaine intoxication or other, deriv- or other types of uh, uh, narcotics in mm-hmm. their systems at the time that this happened, or there were extenuating circumstances, medical conditions. That was taken away. And what they did is they say, we're not going to give you the bar. You can't use the barm or the carotid unless you can justify the application of deadly force. Here's a steel baton with a handle on it. Okay. <laughs> then we have Rodney King. Now, in the old days, if you go back to Rodney King, you can see the officer striking Rodney King and very ineffectual. And in the old days, you just get on him, choke him out, he'd wake up, handcuff, and that was it. End of story, no marks, no bruises, dust him off, put him in the car, don't do that again. Mm. When you take that away, 
and you say, okay, here are all your other use of force options. Understand a policeman has to be a priest, a father confessor, a mediator, perhaps for a paramedic to a degree, a tactics expert, a law expert, a pursuit driving expert, a crime stopping expert, and so forth. They have all these different areas that they have to be quote unquote proficient in. There's only so much time in the day, and there's so much money and funding and re human resources that are allocated to the training of individuals. Now, a lot of officers take it upon themselves to seek out additional training. I did. That's why I went to other schools and so forth and learned way back when. Same thing in terms of martial arts. Some guy, you know, The department's not going to pay you to go take martial arts studies. They're not going to pay you to stay in shape necessarily. They're not going to pay you to ever, you know, to go to outside firearm schools. Many uh, departments, some will hire us, but a lot of times if an officer comes to us, he has to do it on his own budget, his own time, his own vacation time. And that's a huge expense, especially if you're a policeman and you have a family to raise. Hmm. So when you're looking at police officers, very few of them are ever involved, very, very few are ever involved in a deadly force situation. That's number one, in the span of, let's say, 20 years. Most officers, if they work the street for any period of time, are going to be involved in a physical altercation. And a lot of them are perhaps ill-equipped to do so. And there are some people out there um, in the old days, uh, ex-cons, and you've been out to the range, and you've seen that photo I have from San Quentin and those guys in the yard. These guys are all pressing like four or 500 pounds, and they're mm. huge. Mm. And they took the weights out of the California prison system, but believe it or not, those are easier guys to fight because they tired out. Mm. very quickly. You could catch mm. them in a foot pursuit, mm -hmm. and all you had to do was stay off them for a while, about 30 seconds into it, and then you just jump on their back. You're not going to, I mean, they're big, strong guys. Mm. They would call a con build. Now, what they practice are martial arts. They practice ground fighting. They practice MMA in prison. If they're caught, then they get put in isolation, and, and they're doing uh, strength training, endurance training. Mm. So they've actually learned, and I remember watching the first Hoist Gracie, you know, and Hoist mm -hmm. looked like kind of a, he just standing there just kind of meek and, I, I love the guy to death. I mean, yeah. I'd love to meet him. But he's just standing there, the biggest guys in the world would come up, and I'm going to clean this guy's clock, and the next thing you know, he's twisted up like an oily snake. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't know what, no one, nobody knew what to make of it. Yeah. Um, but officers would have to do most of that stuff on their own, and a lot of officers simply aren't willing to do that. And what they do, unfortunately, I think, is they hope that that fight's ne never going to come to them. Mm. They hope that this is never going to happen, and I'm aware of some of the videos I've watched them, and you're looking at them and you go, "Come on, guys, can somebody just get somebody just get a hold of this? Is anybody in shape? Is anybody here willing to, you know, does anybody have any skill that's just mm. going to joint lock this guy up? Let's get the cuffs on him." I will say one thing, and that is some of the toughest fights, altercations I've ever had against suspects are guys that are about five foot six and weigh about 130, 140 pounds. Mm. Un believable and some of those are females mm, yeah again this this goes on the side of a ledger that justifies what many would think to be a kind of paranoia but you you often can't tell how formidable a person is just by looking at them there are women who could choke both of us out they clean our clock. you know <laughs> at the same time you know I, I i know some of these people so it's a uh you know, the, the difference between someone truly being trained and not is is fairly extraordinary, and you also just don't know who's armed. And so, and this this goes to the significance of having firearms spread throughout our society, and at this point, literally having more guns than people. If, if I could interject one yeah. thing, Sam, let me let me just tell you how maybe a typical day might have gone for me working the streets in Metro, especially in SWAT. We'll go from let's say Monday to Friday. And this is how every single day is different. You're subject to call-ups. You're on standby. Uh, you get up, you drive in, you work out. You shower, put on your uniform, go to roll call. You're out there doing high-risk crime suppression. You've got court. Maybe you have court. Uh, maybe the next day you had uh, initially was, um, was scheduled to be off because you're going to go play golf, tuna fishing, or some you know surfing or something. And then you finally, now you have a be there in court subpoena. Mm. Holy smoke. So you go out, you're doing crime suppression, you get to multi-four arrest, felony ops arrest. Now suddenly you're doing paperwork. By the time you finally get out of paperwork, it's now 3 in the morning. So at 3 in the morning now, you drive back home. You get about two hours of sleep. You come up. Now you have to be down at 210 West Temple. 0830, be there in court, Superior Court. You go in. You wait all day. You wait all day. You wait all day in the officer's waiting room, which is uh, medieval. Mm. Absolutely. I don't know. Is the Sada Marquis or something, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and it's just hard wooden benches. No place to do anything. And, up oh, you continue to next day. Jesus. Okay, fine. I go back home. 
I've got two hours of sleep. Go back home, sleep. All of a sudden, guess what? You're on standby tonight. We got to call it. Let's go. Boom. In other words, by the time you get to Friday, you are absolutely wasted. You're tired. Uh, you're just exhausted. You have a family to take care of. You have bills to take care of. The demands that are put on you in law enforcement, and now they have 10 hour, 12 hour shifts. In my day, it was eight hours, five days, eight hours. Hmm. But now they have a 410 and a 312. But even those, you can go overtime and you're just exhausted. And you're spending days just trying to recruit. And it becomes a lifestyle which is extremely stressful. And then at the same time, for the average patrol officer, not in a specialized unit, they can encounter the same thing over time, night after night, be there in court and preparing with DAs and trying to be sharp on the stand and then suddenly going back out. Now I have to work the field. You know, we can't give you a special or a day off because we're underdeployed. So we've got to deploy it. Jeez, okay. You go out, you get another arrest, you're overtime. Mm. And it just goes on and on. So you have to understand policemen don't work bankers' hours. And some of these kids are out there, and my heart goes out to them because they are literally, you know, in some case, they're just overloaded. Hmm. And they're asked to do an incredibly complex job. And I think in some cases that we ask them to do a job that none of us would want to take on, an inherent responsibility that none of us would take on, a risk hmm. that most of us, a hazarding of ourselves to protect others. And when we finally make a decision, when we apply, finally apply for us, a lot of policemen now perhaps go, you know, this is, I can't handle this. Because mm. I'm trying to defend myself, I'm hazarding myself to protect you, and then you're questioning the very method, if you want to go to Jack Nicholson, a few good men, mm. you know, that I take great umbrage at the fact that you're questioning the very manner in which I, you know, provide that protection. That's grossly over-paraphrased. But mm. if you think about it from that term, the next time a cop stops, you, don't have no, you have no idea the next time a police officer stops you. You, know, you, you don't know what's gone on. You don't know what's transpired. You don't know what he's experienced in the last two or three, four days. Right. So I think it goes back to not only officers trying to be more empathetic to law-abiding citizens, but also law-abiding citizens realizing, and I get stopped by police. You yeah. know, I've done the California rolling stop, and, yeah. you know, you got to be kidding me. And they pull me over, okay, and I'm so sorry. The worst, I think the worst thing is you can do is have that contempt to cop when the policeman comes up, do you know who I am? Hmm. Bad call. Bad yeah. call. I'm an attorney. Oh, geez. Bad call. Because <laughs> already you've kind of set the tone and saying, officer, may I help you? You know, could you please tell me what I did? In other words, just respectful. Hmm. And most officers are going to ping on that level of respectability. It's when you start bracing them right at the get-go sometimes that that can be a problem. And I'm not in no way am I exonerating all policemen. There's some policemen out there that have bad attitudes. Hmm. And I've seen it. I assume you would you would concur with this advice that no matter how bad the cop, the time to complain is after mm -hmm. this. You're done following his orders, and I mean, go to the police mm -hmm. station the next day with your lawyer and sue everybody yep. if you were mistreated. But to resist in real time against a a, a cop who is maybe overtly racist or overtly sadistic or overtly unqualified. You could conjure the worst cop on earth. The time to punish him for his incompetence is uh, the day after with your lawyer, not by the side of your car you know, at midnight, having no idea wh how this is going to go south on you. Phenomenally good advice. And the law actually states that even if the officer's actions are illegal at the time, to a degree, you're duty bound to to basically follow his commands, okay, other mm -hmm. than the fact if he's trying to apply, you know, obviously deadly force where that, that would be completely off the charts. But if an officer is issuing commands, you're, you're legally duty-bound to obey those commands and then address it. You have redress through the court system. You have redress through internal affairs systems and so forth. That is what I would recommend to individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I... I am a very, very big proponent of civil liberties, of, of people having their rights. I don't like racism. I don't like cops that are heavy-handed. I don't like cops that come up and, you know, it's just really give off a bad vibe as opposed to the other ones that are proficient. Mm -hmm. And looking at officers that, who have kept themselves in shape, that know what they're doing, that are sharp and everything else, and they come up and they're just real nice and easygoing unless you, as the antagonist, trips the switch, things are going to change. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the that's the officer that I always tried to be. All my partners were like that. All the guys in you know Metro and D team and so forth. All these people that I've known through the years were incredibly professional. But a lot of times you get policemen that 
overstep their bounds. And the best advice I could give to your audience and listeners is you can get upset, you can get angry. I, I, I've got it. You just let the situation go, offer no resistance, comply with his demands, and then address it at a future time. Mm. When we were in, uh, Brett and I were teaching a class in New Hampshire, and we were staying at a bucolic little town there outside of, or it was actually Exeter. And I had parked with two tires in the blue striped lanes. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for Brett. She's going in to get coffee. We're going to go down to Logan to leave. This is after a week out there. And so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden this overweight officer comes up. He's got a belly sagging called Dunlop's disease where your mm -hmm. belly dunlopped over the belt. Mm -hmm. The pistol's way down on the side. He just looked like a soup sandwich. Mm -hmm. And he starts dressing me up and down, telling me, he goes, uh, Mister, I don't know who you think we are, but we don't put up with this kind of hooliganism here in Exeter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you got packed over here in the in the in the blue lines. You need to get out of here. Well, I'm going to give you a ticket if you don't move right now. Huh. And it, it was just, it was hysterical. And he just dressed me up one side and down the other. Now I just, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And the whole mm -hmm. he has no idea who I am. Mm -hmm. He has no idea about my background, what I'm armed with or not. And it was just like, oh, my God. And Brett got in, and she tried to talk, and he said, ma'am, are you driving the car? He's driving the car. I'm not talking to you, ma'am. I was like, okay, just shut up, honey. Don't say anything. So we drove away, and it was a great laugh all the way down to Logan for three hours. It was hysterical. But, again, the guy just, he's probably in luck. He's probably a nice guy. He's not what I would, I would have described as an ideal cop. Mm -hmm. And his tactics were terrible. But I complied. And right. I didn't talk back to him. I didn't let him know I was. I didn't say anything. I just... Yes, sir. I'm so sorry. I'm so, I will never do this again. You know, it's basically, don't you ever come back to Exeter again, Mr. Reitz. You know, <laughs> I, I'm sure my picture's up on their police right. bulletin right now. That's but hilarious. it was absolutely hysterical.